Hi guys, I'm Jolted Hybrid from We Want Bonkers Back and I'm being forced against my will to record this mix for Stuart K Music. Stick around to find out why. I know the secret of why Bonkers was such a huge success and in this video, I'm gonna share that with you. Hi, and welcome to another instalment of Hardcore History. I'm Stuart, and every month I take a look at one of the artists that made our raves memorable. I say one of the artists, but I've been away for two months now, and man has a lot happened. We've experienced a bit of a growth spurt lately, and I want to say thanks to all those who've supported me since the beginning, and welcome to all of you who decided that my little channel was worthy of you clicking subscribe. Also, shout out to DJ Brisk for all your support for Hardcore History. Who would have thought that a nerd like me would have gained the attention of one of the guys we've looked into? Not me. In this, my first video of the year, I'm taking on two of the biggest names in the scene. It's time to look at Hixie and Sharky. Gavin, you were the first one to suggest Hixie way back on the Darren Styles video. And a few of you have since, and now I know why. Grab a drink, because this is a big video with a lot to talk about. Oh, while well, you've got the kettle on. And if you want to, drop a click on that subscribe button, because my list now is huge, so there's going to be lots of videos to come. And if you enjoy this video, I wouldn't have any issues at all with you clicking that like button as well. Let's get to it. As you wanted to hear about him the most, we're going to start with Ian Richard Hicks, or to give him his globally recognised name, Hicksie. Ian describes himself as being quite grumpy, a complete contrast to the happy hardcore sound he promotes. A household name in the scene, Hicksie also enjoys the music of Neil Diamond, Madness and Queen. But who wants to live forever in baggy trousers with Sweet Caroline? Born in 1975 in Portsmouth, England, Ian spent his childhood obsessed with the DMC World DJ Championships, where turntablists would compete to prove their skills as the best scratcher. An early fan of the pirate radio scene and the underground music they would play, when his brother started to receive cassette tapes from Centre Force and Kiss FM radio stations, Ian would nag him to borrow the tapes. As an early teen, Hixie would spend a lot of his time in record shops, including Razzle Records, Powerhouse and Domino Records. He would listen to music in the shops for hours before deciding what to buy. This was because as a young lad, he only had his pocket money to spend, and if you can only afford to buy one record, you're going to make sure it's the right one. In the years that followed, Hixie found himself being drawn to the ravey side of music, and started to sneak into events to see artists such as Fabio and Groove Rider, and Carl Cox, someone who was a huge influence on Hixie, especially after seeing his impressive four deck routine. His first gig was at an event called Overload on the Isle of Wight. On the bill is just Hicks, it was Ian's opportunity to get where he had dreamed of being since his teenage years. Seeing his name on the flyers was a great achievement, but Ian wasn't happy with how it looked. He changed his name to Hicks and started to graft his way through back rooms and warm-up sets until promoters started to notice that he was drawing people in. As his exposure grew and through his connections at the record shops, in 1994, Ian went into the studio upstairs at the Fusion Record Shop with Sunset Regime to record the tracks Technomancer and People's Party. <laughs> After the release through RSR Recordings, co-producer Ramos asked Ian, why are you releasing under the name Hicks when we all call you Hicksie? That's when Ian became Hicksie, but he didn't realise then the huge impact he would have on the happy hardcore scene. Neither did his parents, who although were very supportive of Ian, were as surprised as he was when he brought home that very first royalties check. Hixie soon became a regular on the flyers of Helter Skelter and Dreamscape Raves, and in 1995, with Dougal, bought some studio time on the South Coast. When they came out of the studio, they had hatched a plan to start a new record label together called Essential Platinum. Mickey Skeedale, Force and Styles, and Banana Man are just a few of the artists who had releases on Essential Platinum in the late 90s, as was DJ Druid, which is a great segue into Allow me to introduce Jonathan Neath, born in Plymouth in 1974, someone who prefers to be called John and is also very well known by the name Sharky. 
Throughout his career, he's been an MC, a DJ, a producer, worked in care homes, is quite the chef, and has mentored some of the finest fresh talent in the freeform subgenre. Sharky embodies what happy hardcore has always been fun, energetic, and all about the party. John himself has said that Sharky is just a character, whereas he is, in normal life, quiet and chill. At a young age, John trained in classical piano and played keyboards at many performances for school. Then in 1990, a 16-year-old John, who had a keen interest in the party scene, started to blag his way into raves in southwest Devon, the Midlands and along the south coast, where he met DJ Druid. It was in 1994 when DJ Druid would help Sharky gain his first residency as an MC at the Rhythm Station in Aldershot, a mecca for hardcore back in its day. Back then, there was no genre separation, everything was in one room, and it was all just classed as rave music. Sharky worked and partied hard to prove his talent as an MC, and even helped to promote an event called Plush in East Grinstead. Taking inspiration from 80s legends such as Jean-Michel Jarre and Vangelis and claiming Liam Howlett as one of his favourite artists, John aspired to be a music producer as well as an MC. It was in 1995 that John would realise his dream after walking into DZ aka Darren Bennett's studio in Billericay where Hixie was working on some music. They knew each other from the raves and instantly John was attracted to the keyboards and started to play a riff. Ian's ears pricked up and seeing the potential in the melody, he wanted to record it. So after sampling Sunbeam Outside World, they got to work and put an arrangement together. It sounded okay, but Ian and John weren't quite happy with it. On originally recording the tune, Sharky had played the melody in at double speed. And thanks to emerging technologies, it's the 90s remember, Ian discovered a feature where he could stretch out a piece of audio and effectively halve the speed it was being played at while keeping the rest of the arrangement intact. Released on Dougal and Hicks's Essential Platinum label in the same year, it was an instant hit, something that was predicted when Ian played the test pressing for a few fellow artists, with the response mainly being, Can I have one of them? Can I grab one of them? Can I grab one of them, please? You heard it at every rave, and some people even badged it as their anthem, with football fans adopting the melody for their chants. This caught the attention of one of the biggest dance music labels of the time, React, who had recently released Fact, an album by Carl Cox. Damn good album too. A meeting was arranged and the pair went to React headquarters to discuss licensing of Toy Town to the label. In that meeting, and after seeing posters for the Carl Cox album, Hixie pitched an idea to the executives for a compilation mix album focused on Happy Hardcore. The name for the idea was Bonkers, taken from the name of a bar at Butlin's Minehead where Hixie had played with Ramos and Supreme. It would allow Ian the chance to showcase artists who were making the best happy hardcore to a wider audience. They loved the idea and immediately started to discuss the project. John wanted to get into something similar, and in contrast to the happy style of Hixie, Sharky promoted a different sound, slightly darker and with the freedom to put almost any genre of music into the mix. They both saw the massive potential this could have, casting their net far and wide on the hardcore scene. After hours of discussions, the deal was done, and Ian and John went away to gather music and produce the first ever Bonkers album released in 1996. We're in a cartoon-like design by Paul Garner, a freelance artist from Brighton, who also designed covers for Bjork and the Blues Brothers, the first album didn't chart, and neither did the second. Opinion seems to suggest that the first was actually received much better than the second, with a poll on the forum happyhardcore.com quite a few years back, resulting in Bonkers 1 being hailed as the favourite among fans. Both Hixie and Sharky worked tirelessly, producing new music, promoting the albums and putting on bonkers themed events. 
Sharky didn't have his own equipment initially and he used to use other people's studios which allowed him to learn a lot from some of the greatest dance music engineers of our time such as John Doe, CLSM, Pam and Mark Smith. In 1996, while on his residency with DJ Druid at Tasmania Hastings Pier, John bumped into Kevin Energy when someone didn't show up for their set and an instant connection was made. Druid and Energy went into the studio together as Sharky wanted to expose Kevin to a new sound that was being developed. It was the beginning of the freeform movement, forged primarily by John and Kevin. Then in 1997, Hixie and Sharky brought on Dougal to produce a third mix for Bonkers 3. After managing to secure a place on the supermarket shelves, sales of this third instalment snowballed and gained number one in the Woolworths chart. Do you remember Woolworths? It was a real high street album and sold so well in those stores because the audience was so young and amazed to see something so underground in the shops. It peaked at number 31 in the UK compilations chart, was awarded silver disc status, and in my opinion, was the year that Bonkers became massive. Hixie and Sharky dominated the scene as they built on the success of Bonkers, with Sharky actively seeking out promising new talent to mentor and teach music technology. They both played at raves for Helter Skelter and Fusion through the late 90s and had mixes on a tape pack called Now That's What I Call Hardcore. The cassettes were made up from the DAT recordings at the Bonkers 4 launch party at The Void, Stoke-on-Trent. Bonkers 4 being the one mixed in part in hospital because Ian had broken his neck in a jet ski accident. Pixie was a regular on KISS FM's The Hardcore Show in the late 90s, along with others including Sharky, of course, Dougal, Slipmat and Vibes. Everything seemed to be looking promising for the pair and their new brand. That was until Happy Hardcore declined at the end of the 90s. Sales were dropping, as were the number of people at hardcore events, and Slamming Vinyl held an emergency meeting with a few names from the scene, including Pixie. It was discussed that Slamming Vinyl would have to seriously consider reducing or possibly even stopping hardcore events altogether. Hixie left the meeting not knowing what to do. The scene he loved was in tatters. After a few hard trance productions, Ian still had the fire in his belly for happy hardcore and had a conversation with longtime friend and fellow DJ Jason UFO to see if there was anything that could be done. They both agreed what was needed was an injection of fresh faces to bring some much needed enthusiasm to the scene. Ian had a name in mind and with less than 12 months until Slamming Vinyl hosted at the Sanctuary in Milton Keynes in November 2000, a new label was born. The name of this label, Raver Baby. It was make or break for Hixie as he got to work building the Raver Baby brand. Over the next 10 years, the label helped to reinvent Happy Hardcore with releases from some of the original faces like UFO, MC Storm and Breeze and Styles and some new ones including Technicore, Recon and someone who became a close friend of Ian's, the late Squaddy. With a more streamlined production style, new sounds and improvements in music technology such as synths, samplers and computers, this was the new sound of hardcore. It was heavily influenced by trance with elements of hard house, a genre that Ian had an interest in. Every release was vinyl only, and while a lot of other labels have begun to post their back catalogue to streaming services and digital music stores, Raver Baby still has not at the time of recording this. In an interview for Raw, the Rave podcast, Ian stated that it's in the works, however due to licensing, it's taking longer than it should. While Ian was busy rebuilding the scene, John was still on the freeform train with Kevin Energy, who founded the New Energy Collective. The parties co-hosted by John and Kevin were wild, but in 2002, Sharky's body just couldn't take the punishment anymore. In a post to the United States of Hardcore website in 2002, John announced he was retiring as an MC. Once he started with the um, party prescriptions, he couldn't stop and had spent time in rehab twice. 
a massive blow to the scene, who while devastated we were about to lose one of the finest MCs we had, all stood behind John in support of his decision. While he did retire as an MC, he never actually stepped away from the scene, still producing and teaching at every opportunity he could. Then in 2003, on the message board happyhardcore.com, a user by the name DJ Specs decided as he didn't like Sharky's mixes on the Bonkers series, that John should be sacked by React or, you know, the community erupted as Specs dug a deeper and deeper hole for himself in what became a 14 page post where he verbally attacked Sharky and other members and claimed that no Glaswegian liked the DJ who's only in it for the money. The next day, John, who'd been a member of the site almost since the beginning, was ready to respond. Mop it, idiot! Mop it! Mop it! Mop it! I'll give you the TLDR because John, and rightly so, had plenty to say. He tried to explain that once, hardcore was one-sided, and that led to the genre failing. When it did, he didn't make much money from it, and even paid others out of his own pocket. He would frequently be online, helping others with their own musical journey, whatever their learning curve or genre choice, and without pay. It does show a lack of understanding of the scene to suggest that any of it is about money. James Horrocks of the record label React soon discovered after the Bonkers launch that this was a scene about music, energy and partying and not the money. At an end of year audit, it was discovered that a £25,000 royalties check made out to Ian hadn't been cashed. Just sat in a drawer in Ian's house for 12 months. After the DJ Specs incident, Sharkster went back to being Sharky, the life of any party. While Hixie teamed up with Styles and Breeze and worked with labels all around the world and Universal Music TV to bring Clubland Extreme Hardcore, an offshoot of the Clubland series that had been very popular already. The series ran from 2005 and gained two number one spots in the UK compilation charts for the first and second album. Ian was involved in organising the Hardcore Till I Die in the Sun events in Lorette de Mar Spain and played a lot of events for the brand including the Weekender and the Summer Gathering. With Mark Lambert, the man behind Sidewinder Events who owned the brand, Pixie established the label HTID in 2011 as an outlet for his production. Sharky on the other hand announced in January 2011 that he would be retiring from the music scene before finishing his world tour and officially retiring in September of the same year. In the years that followed, Hixie continued to prove his dedication to the scene and someone whose name you saw on the bill a lot. But something was still missing and on the 25th of September 2015, a Facebook group was created called We Want Bonkers Back. Headed up by former manager of Bass Generator Radio, Jilted Hybrid, this was a group tasked with one job, bring back bonkers. Being such a beloved brand, the group quickly gained interest as people joined the movement, posting daily about upcoming raves, music from anthems of yesteryear to modern or upcoming tracks, and of course discussing the collective goal of these like-minded individuals. The group is now well over 11,000 members, all very active and thanks to group creator Jilted Hybrid and of course admins Stevie Brown and DJ Violet, aka Stu Wren who've been with him since the start. Also, I should say thanks and shout out to Jilted Hybrid who mixed the music in the background of this video. I'll put it up on Mixcloud for you all to check out later as it's a bonkers inspired mix and it's off the hook. The link for that and the Facebook group will be down in the description. During 2015, we started to see appearances from Sharky and in 2021, John's Facebook page started to come back to life. Rumours started to circulate and it didn't take long before we saw the full-time return of Sharky to the scene as a DJ and an MC. Then came the announcement of a radio show on Beats 106 Scotland called Bonkers Beats. Was this the moment so many had longed for? 
heard every Friday night with Hixie, Sharky, Dougal and Scott Brown at the helm, the scene flocked to the show, which saw guests such as DJ Druid, Daniel Seven and Digital Commandos. During a show, Hixie and Sharky announced that there would be a new Bonkers album coming soon. Since then, the Bonkers train has been at full speed, with themed events alongside Ravers Reunited, Hard Times and Religion. The classic Grand in Glasgow featured bonkers events with even more coming later this year at the boxed venue in Leicester. The radio show on Beats 106 Scotland regularly has many of the older and newer faces within the scene and keeps going from strength to strength as a place to promote and hear some of the greatest talent in hard dance. We're still no closer to any word of the next album in the Bonkers series, but this could be as they build up funds for such a project. I've heard many times that compilation albums need a fur size wallet up front. So why was Bonkers such a huge success? If you didn't get the answer to that question already, allow me to join the dots. You see, as we've seen over the past 20 minutes or so, both Ian and John, when involved in it, were 100% dedicated to the scene and making it a success. From rocking parties with their music and MCing, going out to look for new artists when the genre started to dry up, and even mentoring or putting their hand in their own pocket or defending the scene when necessary. Hixie and Sharky have worked relentlessly since the 90s. It would go without saying that a series of happy hardcore based mix albums promoted by one of the biggest dance music record labels of all time and spearheaded by two of the most determined men in hardcore is a sure bet to be a success. Don't worry, I'm not just going to finish the video with me blowing smoke up their ass. I did notice one other thing while researching this video, and it's a pattern that could be important in the appeal of Bonkers. On each mix, you'll notice that out of the 16 or so tracks, there's only ever 5 or 6 from the artist recording the mix. Have a look at yourself at the track listings and think. In a world where we go to see DJs and 90% of their set is their own music, isn't it a bit of a breath of fresh air? To get some variety. Thank you so much for watching this video and for sticking around till the end. We had a lot of information to take in and there's still more out there. If you want to know more, can I recommend the Raw Rave podcast? There's a good few hours of interviews and bonus content with Hixie. This month, you get a guest mix from my new mate, Jilted Hybrid. Link for both of those and the Facebook group, We Want Bonkers Back, down below. Finally, before I let you go, I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I still don't have any objections to you slapping that like button and if you want to subscribe there's a button down there for that too i'll be back next month with another episode of hardcore history i'll see you then